Hey there, Adrian Rosebrock here from PyMidSearch.com, and today we're going to have an introduction to neural networks. So we need to understand the basics of neural networks before we can move into deep neural networks, where we learn, you know, not only more advanced techniques, but more of the nuances surrounding how to construct these deeper networks, and how to train them on larger data sets. So the first thing I want to kind of discuss is you know, what we see when looking at an image or and, and what a computer sees. And more specifically, you know, what the intelligence of a young child would have. So on the left-hand side, we have this photo of a friendly dog. It's obviously, you know, wants to be near the human. It wants to be pet. It wants, it wants attention. And a child, a young child, intuitively understands this. Not only does a child understand that it's a dog, but it's a friendly dog. It's a dog that you can, you can play with, you can pet, and there won't be a problem. Then on the right-hand side, we have this dog that's showing uh, more aggressions, more fierce. Now, a child still understands that it's a dog, but it also understands that it's an angry dog. That's a dog I don't want to go near because I may get hurt. A computer, on the other hand, it doesn't have any understanding of that. Even a more advanced neural network can classify the image as dog. At both of these images as dog and do so correctly, but it, it may not necessarily infer that the difference between a friendly dog and an angry dog or a fierce dog without additional information. So my point here is to say that Neural networks are very, very powerful algorithms, but at the end of the day, we're still processing at a level you know, that, that a young child has. And that just goes to show you the complexities of the human brain and how, how we learn, especially during young age. Now, another good example here is on the bottom are these examples of buses. A young child, again, can understand both of these images are buses, but a young child can also understand, hey, that image on the left, that's a school bus. I know that's a school bus. And the image on the right, that's a different type of bus. That's a transport bus or a commuter bus. So again, just try and keep this in mind as we study computer vision and deep learning, that even with how advanced our neural networks get with our, how advanced our um, learning algorithms become and the different optimization methods we apply, that we're still operating kind of at a, at a younger child level intelligence. And this, and this notion of trying of mimicking the human brain with what we, we do with neural networks, that's not really the case. But that said, there is absolutely a relation to biology with neural networks. And here we have the neuron anatomy with the dendrite, the nucleus, the soma, the myelin sheath, and the axon. So the dendrites, these are the inputs in a neural network in this analogy. So these dendrites connect to other neurons, and then the axon is the output. So that axon is connecting to, to other dendrites. Now what happens is due to this, due to reaction in the in the human brain, we get these, these signals that come in through the dendrites and the, the body of the, the neuron processes it. And what happens is either the neuron fires and then therefore sends the signal through the axon and the axon you know activates other dendrites or nothing happens. The signal terminates within the body of the neuron and nothing comes out the axon and therefore the uh, neurons connected to the axon don't activate. What this really means here is that an activation is binary. Either the neuron fires or it does not. So a neuron is receiving some sort of sort of stimulus, maybe it's gradual, but if it doesn't hit, hit this certain peak threshold, then the neuron is not going to fire. You actually have to have enough activation. And once you hit that activation threshold, all of a sudden, you know, your voltage goes up and then that's where the activation point comes out and then starts activating other neurons as well. That said, you know, neural networks are inspired by the human brain, but they are not mimics of the brain. And this is kind of a common misconception I see to those new to artificial intelligence and specifically neural networks. They think they see the hear the name neural network and they're like, oh man, this is this is the epitome of artificial intelligence. We're mimicking the human brain. We're doing interactions like the human brain does. No, that's that's not the case. The human brain is not equal to the the neural networks that we're processing. And I don't mean that in just a strictly intelligence or processing capacity. I mean in the actual design of the networks themselves. So we're using what we've learned from biology, but we're not trying to mimic the biological point itself. So let's let's kind of break down and discuss what an artificial neural network is. So on the left side here, we have these inputs. And if this were to be a, you know, a replica of the human anatomy, well, the inputs here would be the inputs to the dendrites, to the, to the human anatomy uh, neuron. So 
But in, in computer vision and machine learning and artificial intelligence, these inputs could be whatever you're working with. If it's image data, it could be raw pixel intensities. If it's stock market data, it could be prices of given equities on a given day. If you're trying to predict Bitcoin prices, it could be the prices of Bitcoin at a, at a given day. If you're doing text processing, it could be the occurrences of, of certain words in a paragraph. You know, the actual inputs here are arbitrary. The inputs are just whatever it is that you're trying to model and learn from. So these inputs are then connected to weights. These are essentially the neurons of the neural networks. And we could stack and stack and stack these neurons on top of each other to learn deeper and richer patterns inside our data. But the, at the end of the day, these weights are just values. They could be positive or they could be negative. And we're going to multiply these weights with their inputs, sum all of that together, and then pass it through the step function. So this step function is equivalent to your activation function. So you're going to have this weighted sum coming into it. And if this weighted sum is not large enough, well, then this step function is not going to activate and the output's going to be zero. But if you have sufficient large sum coming in, then what's going to happen is that step function is going to hit that critical threshold. It's going to bounce up to one and then that neuron will be considered activated. So let's look at an example here. And we have these inputs to the neural networks. They're just arbitrary values that I plugged in. And what happens is we can express this mathematically. So you could say f of you know the weight uh, weight one times x one plus weight two times x two all the way through all the inputs and weights in your network. You could concisely write that as a summation operation, or simply what we would call f of net, where net is is just your input all the way through the output, and f of net is therefore your your output through through the neural network. The question then becomes is well, what's the activation function here, right? If if all we're doing is taking this sum of weight sub i times x sub i, where does the activation function actually come in? And here you can see that example is once we've performed this summation of multiplying our x's and w's together, we get this activation function. And that that is where we express kind of the, the non-linearity of, of neural networks. So when we first, one of the first neural networks you study, and we're going to study it soon inside this course, is the perceptron algorithm. It utilized the step function. So the f of the network is equal to one if that summation and multiplication operation is greater than zero. Otherwise, we set it to zero. The problem with this method is that it's not differentiable. That makes it hard for us to learn how to learn from our input data and how to update our weights such that the network makes more intelligent decisions. So soon after the perceptron algorithm was introduced, we started studying other activations and trying to create these deeper, deeper neural networks. And one of the two more popular activation functions at the time were the sigmoid activation and the hypertangent. The sigmoid has an activation in the range zero to one. As you can see, it's kind of this, this ramp, this almost like S-shaped curve where you ramp up. And what's really nice about the sigmoid is that it can be, in some cases, used as a proxy for probability. And you'll see that pretty often in the neural network literature. So sigmoid was pretty common. We still use it today in some cases. Then we have the hypertangent, which has a activation in the range negative one to one. We used hypertangent a lot in the original early days of neural networks. We don't use it as much now, but you'll still see it in particular with generative adversarial networks. And you know, we'll discuss why that is once we get to GANs, but at this point, I'm just trying to expose you to different activation functions that have been used. Now, the ReLU activation function is arguably the most famous activation function. Once we started training these deep neural networks, we needed more intelligent activation functions, functions that worked better. And it turned out that ReLU, standing for rectified linear unit, is one of the best methods. And whenever you implement a neural network, you know, in Keras and TensorFlow and PyTorch, the odds are you're going to be using ReLU activation 99% of the time. And it's a simple activation function. It grows linearly for any input greater than zero. And for any value less than zero, it just clamps that value down to zero. The problem is that you kind of get that, that discontinuity around x equals zero. So then we have variations of ReLU called leaky ReLU and uh, exponential ReLU. And then those values have this small little asymptote that allows you to gradually go below zero and take on negative values. There are certain situations when you'll use both leaky ReLU and the exponential version of it. That said, we're less concerned about that. The standard ReLU turns out works very well 
and you can sub in these variations of Relu to increase your accuracy in certain situations. Now, there are there are caveats to this, and there are edge cases where you absolutely should be using these variants, but as long as you understand that Relu is the activation function you're going to be using the fast, vast majority of the time, well, then you understand the key takeaway of this lesson and this discussion of activation functions. So now we've discussed activation functions, we're going to learn how to implement the Perceptron algorithm by hand. We're going to discuss that in the next tutorial, and you're going to learn all about how to create inputs to a Perceptron network, how to initialize this, this weight matrix, how to perform this the multiplication of the inputs with the weights, compute the sum, pass it through the step app activation function, check to see if your prediction was correct or not, and if it wasn't, you're going to learn how to tune those weights such that your network becomes smarter over time. So let this material sink in. You don't need to understand every single detail. It's meant to be a high-level overview of what you're going to learn in this next set of lessons. So I'll see you next time when we discuss the Perceptron.